Good morning, church. It is good to see all of you here this morning. And I especially want to welcome you if you're visiting with us for the first time. My name is Jim West, and I get to be the lead pastor here. And today, uh, we're doing something a little bit special. It's Actually, it's a lot bit special. And that is that we are going to have Pastor Greg Ely come deliver the message. And I just want to give you a little background about that. Uh, eight months ago, we uh, had a transition in our church, and our former campus pastor moved on from our Warnell campus, which is on 95th and Warnell. And so a committee of 12 uh, church members have been serving together as a pastor search committee for eight months and seeking the Lord. And as a church, we've been praying that God would lead the, just the right person to this position. We had 62 people uh, apply for the position and eight that were interviewed and, and uh, looked at very intensely. And after this season of, of discernment today, uh, that pastor search committee is bringing a recommendation to the congregation that we uh, vote together as members of the church to welcome Pastor Greg Ely into that position as the Warnell campus pastor. And part of the way that that sometimes gets done in churches is for them to have what we call just a candidate Sunday where they have an opportunity to come and proclaim the gospel prior to our gathering together as a family. And so that gathering will happen at 12 o'clock at both locations. Uh, it'll be live at the Warnell campus, obviously. But uh, we'll also kind of beam it in over here at 12 o'clock. So if you'd like to come back and participate as members of the church and exercise your opportunity to, to exercise your voice and your vote, uh, we welcome you to do that. And then following the congregational meeting at the Warnell campus, there will be a reception uh, on, on enough food to feed an army. So we hope that you'll come and, and join us and celebrate. We're very much counting on a positive vote because Greg's awesome. And uh, just a little bit about Greg, he's served the last eight years at uh, Paseo Baptist Church in downtown Kansas City. Uh, his season came to an end, and he uh, applied for this position on, uh, in uh, late August, mid-August, and it's a great story. Now, some of you know that Greg has preached here before back in 2010, and that he and I have been very good friends for the past eight years. But I want you to know that the Lord did not even allow me to consider asking Greg to think about this job. I kind of feel stupid now that I didn't even consider it. Um, but I, I didn't really know that he would be open to it at the time. And the way that that came about is a great God story. I'll be sharing that at the congregational meeting. So you'll need to come back to hear that story. Uh, but it really is a fantastic God story that led Greg to be standing on our stage today. On behalf of our 1045 congregation that will be watching this on the video, I'm going to ask, they're going to hate this, but I'm going to ask the whole Ely family to come and stand on the stage with me for just a minute. This is, the, this is a flyer. I know I didn't check with you first, but if you guys come on up here for just a minute, let me introduce you. Of course, this is a, uh, yeah, we're happy to see you. So let me introduce you. This is Pastor Greg and uh, his beautiful wife, Selena, his oldest son, uh, Elias, and then his youngest son, Emmanuel. And I hope that you'll spend time getting to know them. I know it's going to be tough uh, because they're mostly going to be at the Warnell campus, but Greg will actually be back here preaching next Sunday as well, so you get a chance to hear him twice in two weeks. And uh, just get to know and love this beautiful family. Christy and I have known the Ely's uh, for eight years, and we consider them dear friends. And so I hope that you will too. But we welcome you. We're just so glad that you're here. So you guys can go sit down. Sorry to embarrass you. Church, will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for this man. I thank you for the way you've made him, for the passion he has for the gospel, for the city, and for the call, the supernatural call that you bring on a pastor's life to arrange a, a time where he is to come and to serve with a particular expression of your church. And we thank you that you have been good to us to bring Greg to serve with our family for this season. And I pray your anointing upon him now as he brings the word of God and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ 
May your power flow through him into our hearts that we be convicted of who you are and who we are and just how much you love us, that we may be one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. I'm sure I will pay dearly for Jim asking my family to come up on stage. It's going to be a lot of out going out to eat in McDonald's dinners in the next few days. It's okay. It's on you, Jim. Thank you. I am excited to be here. I have to admit I have been thoroughly nervous. Um, good thing about being nervous is that you kind of rely on the Holy Spirit, right? But I'm, I was real nervous. I was so nervous that we had Q39 ribs last night, and I only had one. <laughs> I'm too serious, so I got to go replay that whole thing out over again. <laughs> but I'm, I am excited to be here, glad to be here. So I know that we're um, moving for time. I want to talk to you today um, from the subject, we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it says this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. I say it three times, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. That way, for those of you who just woke up, you can get your Bible out now. Or... <laughs> Chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it says, Again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This is also his vanity and unhappiness, unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to the one, woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no other to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three-four cord is not quickly broken. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Peanuts cartoon. Peanuts with Linus and Lucy and all of those. I was watching one of the episodes and uh, Lucy comes in and demands, Linus, turn the channel. She threatens him with her fists. If he didn't, he he says, what makes you think that I'm going to change the channel? What makes you think you can just walk in here and take over? Lucy says, these five fingers, that's why. Individually, they're nothing. But when you curl them together, they're a weapon that is terrible to behold. (laughs) Linus says, what channel do you want to watch? (laughs) (laughs) Then he turns to his hands and he says, why can't you guys come together like that? (laughs) You know, we find ourselves in a similar predicament today. Violence is on the rise. Racism is on the rise, it's winning the battle. Families are breaking down right in front of us. In our neighborhoods, our cities, our schools are looking at the church and saying, why can't you come together like that? I mean, Muslims are organized on the corner. Atheists are are working together to normalize abortion and to break down the sanctity of marriage. The entertainment industry is pushing their agenda. And the hopeless are looking at us who have hope and asking, why can't you come together like that? And it was seen with all the resources that we have that we should be able to come together. And what we need to know is that when we decide to come together, there's no atheist, there's no gang, there's no Muslim organization that will be able to hinder our cause for Christ if we decide to stand together. And I I know it's hard because from the time we were kids, we're conditioned to look out for number one. We're trained to be me pleasers. It's it's in our DNA to be self-promoters. That's, that's the world we live in. The culture teaches us to look out for number one, to, um, to don't trust anyone, to put yourself first. We've decided that we can accomplish more as individuals and less if we decide to work together. But I beg to differ. So I ask you a question today. Where are you today? Where are you in your ability to work with others to accomplish the will of God? 
Where are you in relation to joining in with the rest of the church to doing the will of God? I know there, there may be some here today, you tried the teamwork approach, you tried to working together, you tried going across those lines and it only backfired and you, you got stabbed in the back, you got your feelings hurt. Someone else, maybe you saw somebody else get hurt, and you say, I decide to avoid that hurt. It's best to work by myself and keep everyone else away. Because being isolated, it's the, it's the underlying theme of our culture. In some places, it's not even underlying. It's flat out. Uh, Dr. Uh, Han Selv, in his book I was reading, <clears throat> it's a book called Stress Without Distress. In it, he says this, quote, a strong dose of selfishness is the best way of achieving a happier, saner society. You get that? A strong dose of selfishness is the best way of achieving a happier, saner society. He even goes on to attack the Bible's celebrated theme of loving thy neighbor as thyself. He says, that's biological heresy, to love thy neighbor as thyself. Society has conditioned us to believe that rather than be concerned with what's best for the whole, we should worry about what's best for me. We're taught and conditioned it. We, we, it's molded into us, and, and, and somehow we believe it's going to speed us up, and that being connected only slows us down. And the problem with that is we've allowed that thinking to enter into the church. We've allowed the mind of individualism to unconsciously sink into the church. When Jesus prayed... In John chapter 17, he didn't say um, that we should be offended by others, hunker down and turn inward and focus on ourselves. That was not his prayer. John chapter 17, he says, the glory that you have given me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that what the world may know, that you sent me and love them even as you love me. His prayer was that we will be one as seeing the Father is one. And I know if you've been hurt by trying to work with others that this may be a hard thought for you. I know some of you have tried to put someone else's interest before your own only to be stabbed in the back, but I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to see past culture, to see past color, to see past denominations, and I'm going to challenge you to only see Christ. There's a church on every corner. Colonial is one church, two locations, but we can't do it alone. Quivira can't build the kingdom alone. Warno can't build the kingdom alone, but we can do it together. We can make it together. We can handle it together. We can struggle together. The church can work together. What I want to show you today is there are some consequences to trying to do it alone but then there's benefits of trying to link arms and working together and watching what God do with his work. We're looking at the text today of uh, Ecclesiastes, and this is a book <clears throat> that is believed to be written by Solomon in the latter part of his life. And he tells the, tells the story of Solomon's quest to find happiness through riches. And his, he was trying to find his happiness through his work and, and many other pleasures. But ultimately, his search was futile. And in chapter 1, verse 2, he sums all of his search in one sentence, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I tried to work, I tried to gain, I tried to pleasure, all of it came to nothing. And considering this, in chapter four, he explains the contrast of living a selfish, separated life against living a life that maximizes life benefits. And what I want us to see today is that living life in unity with other Christians maximizes life's value. And in order to and receive or, or perform the best in the time that God has for us, we got to connect ourselves. We got to work together. In order to survive, there must be unity in the body of Christ. Denominational walls need to be torn down. Cultural and racial walls need to come down. Social, economic walls need to come down. And my prayer for Colonial is that we help bring these walls down. And I hope that's your prayer as well. Solomon in this, this chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, he has some principles that I believe are beneficial for us to see the importance of living in unity opposed to trying to think we can do it by ourselves. And he, again, he shows some negative consequences, but he ends with some positive benefits. And, and so the first thing we learn from this passage it, that the negative consequences is this. Working alone magnifies your misery. 
Working alone magnifies your misery. Verse 7 and 8, it says, Again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there's no end to all his toil. He works, 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 and he does have a family to, to look to, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. See, what is described here is a man who had decided that the most important thing in his life was to attain the wants of his life. He probably wasn't used to sharing the credit. Maybe he tried to be the power player in his organization. And the problem with that is no matter how much he attained, there was never any satisfaction. It was never enough. And verse 8 tells us that with all his labor, his eyes were never satisfied with his riches. You know, another word for toil in that verse is labor. In the Hebrew, it can be translated misery or trouble. So what it's saying is that in all of his misery, he cannot be satisfied with what he gains. This man already has a life of misery, but then further into the verse, we see that on top of the misery of his search for riches, he has no fam family or companion to pass his wealth on to, just toil. And the end of verse 8, it says, this is on top of the misery. So you have misery that is magnified because he's not associated with anyone. His misery is magnified because he has no one to share his joy with, no one to share his life with. I don't know, maybe he's driven, he driven everybody away because he tried to run their lives. Maybe he's driven everyone away because he wouldn't listen to their advice. Maybe he's driven everyone away because he felt he could handle life on his own. Maybe he has a lack of being able to take the back seat and let somebody else lead sometimes. It doesn't tell us, but we know this, that his misery is magnified because he's trying to live life unconnected. We learn from that that a person that only seeks to satisfy themselves will not be satisfied with the results. A person that only seeks to satisfy themselves will not be satisfied with the results. In the same vein, a church that doesn't take advantage of opportunities to link up with the community, a church that doesn't connect with its neighbors, build relationships with those around him will not be satisfied with the results. In the verse 8, it says, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. How many of you want to be a part of an unhappy business? Me neither. The result of separating himself and isolating himself was that at the end of his life, he had no one to share with. Not only did he have a grievous task of laboring, but it's made worse because he had to do it alone. And I hear you saying, Pastor Greg, I... I just want to avoid any of those unnecessary worries and, and all of that strife, and I just keep to myself. Pastor Greg, what if, what if our attempts to reach those unreached in our community only creates new problems? Yep. That may all be true. However, Solomon says here, when you try to avoid unnecessary worry and strife by keeping yourself alone, you actually magnify your misery. You don't get rid of it, you make it worse. Because by pushing others away, when it's all said and done, no one's there to pat you on the back. No one's there to support you. No one's there to smile when you've done a good job. And also, there's no one there to bear your disappointment. There's no one there to help shoulder the mistakes because your misery is only magnified. Thanks be to God, that's not where the verse ends. He says, when there's, you try to separate and live alone you magnify your misery but then he quickly turns and gives us some positive benefits of what happens when we decide to walk in unity and he teaches us this walking in unity will multiply our production walking in unity will multiply our production he's previously stated some disadvantages now he gives us some advantages of living in harmony rather than selfishly divided he's he teaches us that you'll accomplish more when you decide to work together than you will if you decide to do it alone. We can't do it alone. Verse 9 says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. 
That's what you call ROI in the business world, return on investment. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. And I know sometimes we get in situations and feel that the best way to get things done is to work with the familiar, not bother with other people's schedules and other people's red tapes and the history of what's happened. But the text here tells us that as much as you think you can do by yourself, you can do at least at least twice as much as you decide to work together. That's, you know, I'm a math person. That's a mathematical concept. That what one person can do alone, two people more than doubles the work. If you have one brother going out to share the gospel, he may very well lead a few to Christ. But if another brother decides to go with him, the few turns to many. And as many as you add to that equation, the more lives are being brought to God. What one church, what one location, what one body can do is more than doubled when they link arms with the neighborhood schools, when they link arms with the community organizers, when they step out of their comfort zone and work with new people, you will accomplish more. It's a benefit. Another benefit he tells us is walking in unity provides partnerships that hold each other up. Walking in unity provides partnerships that hold each other up. And as you are doing the work of God, if you are doing the work of the kingdom, you need partnerships that help hold you up. Verse 10 says, for if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. What is in mind here are two travelers. The role of your companion was to help you when you found yourself in troubled situations. Have you ever been in trouble? I know I'm talking to people in the foyer, not you guys. No one's in here ever (laughs) experienced any trouble ever in life. You found yourself where you made a mistake, you needed someone to walk with you through it. You feel like you need companionship. You feel alone and you need that word of encouragement. Some of you barely got to church today just trying to get in the front door, waiting for that smile and that handshake to say welcome to Colonial. And that's going to help you get through the day. I I know the benefit. Your pastor, Pastor Jim, has been that for me. When it seemed like the trouble was overbearing, when it seemed like life had crashed in on, I can call Jim and say, hey, man, I need a word of encouragement. He said, all right, let's go (laughs) fishing. And I tell you, the stuff that's out on the lakes in the Kansas City area stays on the lakes in the Kansas City <laughs> area. But he's been there to hold me up, to walk with me as a partner in this ministry. You know, I was walking near a playground, and I heard some commotion. I looked over, and I saw a little boy had fell on the ground, and he's rolling over like all of his ankles and legs are broken, and he's crying, and Screaming like, you know, like six-year-old kids do when they fall off of stuff. <clears throat> and he's just rolling and, and, and screaming. And all of a sudden, two other boys come up, and they pick him up, and they dust him off. And he jumps up and kicks his legs. And before you know it, he's running back around the playground again like nothing ever happened. And God showed me that's what I need my children to do. When they fall in sin, someone should be there to pick them up. When they fall in depression, someone should be there to pick them up. When they fall in their relationships, someone should be there to pick them up. When they fall and feel as though they are alone and need to be, someone needs to be right by their side. Helping them, carrying them, holding each other up. Because woe to the one who falls when there is not another to pick him up. Woe to the one who finds himself in trouble and has no companion who will help him. We can't do it alone, but we can do it together. Another benefit is walking in unity will provide comfort in time of need. Verse 11, he says, again, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Think of these travelers again. When it's time to rest And the night gets cold. If a traveler was alone, rest was not easy because it was just too cold. But if they're two, the body heat from each other would provide the comfort needed to get the rest necessary to keep traveling. Just like it takes more than one to keep warm physically, 
it is impossible to stay spiritually warm without the comfort of other believers. It is impossible to stay spiritually warm without the comfort of other believers. Let me say that again. It is impossible to stay spiritually warm without the comfort of other believers. When I was younger, <clears throat> we would go to my grandfather's house for Christmas, and he'd, he'd take logs and, and stack them on top of each other in the fireplace, and there'd be this big pile of logs, and he'd light them on fire, and the fire would blaze, and it, it warmed the whole room, and the, and the flames were beautiful, and we'd just sit there and, and just were hypnotized by the fire and drew in by the warmth of the flame. But every once in a while, one of the logs on top would roll off to the corner of the fireplace. And before long, the, the log that had rolled off would begin to simmer and, um, and begin to almost ash over. And it looked like that all was lost for that log. It was still in the fireplace. But it had rolled just enough away from the fire that it began to turn cold. But it wouldn't be long before my grandfather came over and he'd grab that log and he'd, he'd place it right back on the fire. And as soon as he placed it back on the fire, that once cold, tossed away log now had fire again. It now had flames again. It was now a part of the fire once more. See, some of us in the church have strayed just enough away from the fire to get cold spiritually. We may still show up on Sunday. We may still come to worship. We may still appear to be doing okay, but we strayed just far enough away to miss out on the benefits of linking up with the fire. But God is telling you today to get back on the fire. He's placed you here in the fire, and it's burning. Link up with some other brothers and sisters. The good thing is no matter how far you've been away, no matter how cold you've gotten, you can still catch fire for God. You can still desire to be in his presence, still desire his word, still to love his fellowship, still surround yourself with godly people so that in times of need, when you need comfort, they will be there to comfort you, to hold you up, for one cannot be comforted alone. Another benefit and one of the final benefits he gives us is he says, walking in unity provides the capability to withstand the enemy. Walking in unity provides the capability to withstand the enemy. Verse 12 says, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Keeping our travelers in mind here. See, occasionally a situation would rise where the travelers would encounter robbers and thieves who would try to overpower them and take their possessions. And if there were two travelers, the likelihood of having your belongings taken would decrease. And if there were three travelers, your chance of withstanding the tax would increase. We have an enemy called Satan. His plan is to attack and destroy. The Bible tells us that he is constantly seeking whom he may devour. So as believers, how do we have a chance? Romans 15 and 1 says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The word obligation, some of your versions may say, we ought to bear the failings of the weak. It's, it's what we call present continuous. That basically means it's emphasizing the continuous obligation. There is an ongoing obligation to bear with the weak. There is an ongoing obligation to hold your brother up. There's an ongoing obligation for you to look after one another. We have to avoid... You know, the, the natural reaction, the natural tension that when we are in trouble to separate. Or that if we see somebody else in trouble, we run. You know you get that one phone call when it rings. You know who it is so you don't answer the phone. Maybe none of you experienced that, I'm sorry. But we have to be careful not to separate ourselves, not, not to try to push away, but to draw in close, not to only bring in 
the familiar, but to get uncomfortable and get around the unfamiliar. You know, we can't be like Tonto. You know, Tonto and the Long Ranger were riding through a canyon together, and all of a sudden on both sides were filled with Indians on horses. They were dressed for battle. And the Long Ranger, he turned to Tonto, and he says, Tonto, what are we going to do? And Tonto says, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> I'm familiar. I know where I am. Rather than be separated, we need to join together and stand strong. Where do you need strength today? Where do, where do you need strength in your life? Where do you need strength in your organization? Where do you need strength in your neighborhood? What is attacking you that you cannot withstand on your own? What has Satan zeroed in on that requires the strength of the body to come alongside you to provide strength to overcome? The body is there to help those in need of strength. But Solomon tells us here, alone we're vulnerable, but together we're powerful. So it's the conclusion. We've seen that living life unassociated, it only maximizes, magnifies the, mis the misery. We've seen how living united, it, it minimizes our misfortune. It, it, it brings us closer together with companionship and comfort and, and the capability to withstand the enemy. You know, and I, and I think about, you know, bees, and you see bees, and they're such irritants, and they're irritable, and, you know, we go out to the baseball park, and it seems like they're always wherever you don't want them to be all the time. They're small. But what bees realize is they can't survive on their own. When the weather is hot, their hives get hot. And so in order to cool the whole hive, their little wings, which can't do anything by themselves, but when you get a million bees doing their wings like this, it cools the whole hive down. I wonder if I'm making any heads way. <laughs> and so when it gets cold, they can't keep warm by themselves, so they swarm together because they understand their survival rests in their ability to, close, to be close to one another. When they're by themselves, they can't generate enough heat. But when they join together, they heat the whole swarm so that each bee pushes closer because they know we need each other. We as believers need to push closer. We have to live in unity. And in a world that's against the church, we have to see our survival rest on our understanding the need for each other. We have to put away selfishness. We have to forgive those who need forgiveness for whatever hurt they've done. It's, it's time to forget about that, to link arms and say together we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Jesus prayed that we as believers will be one as he and the Father are one. Why? So that we may be perfected in unity. And so the world may know that God sent Jesus and demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our message, the gospel message, is dependent on our unity. Let me say that again. The gospel message is dependent on our unity. I heard a preacher this week say, Christ is our testimony, but our unity is our credibility. Christ is our testimony. We can go out there and push, push the word of God all day long, but they want to see it. And the unity is our credibility. Our gospel needs an example, and we working together is that example. Jesus came so that we can live in unity. Jesus lived a perfect life so that we can live in unity. He died so that we can live in unity, but most of all, he rose from the grave with all power in his hands so that we can live in victory and live in unity. I need you. This is not a competition. This is the work of God to save the world, and I need you to do my part. I can't do this by myself. Jim can't do it by himself. Todd can't do it by himself. But we can do it together. We can see the gospel push forward together. We could see the church work together to do things that can be unimaginable when we watch God do his part. 
And the church said, amen. amen. The Heavenly Father, we bless your name today. We thank you, Lord, for this message of unity. Use it, Father. Use us for the ongoing of your kingdom. And we will give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.